Disc 05, Sorcery By Terry Pratchett Audiobook 9x15 Well, then. There's 90,000 of them, mind, said another wizard. I always heard there was no end to M, said another. It's all down to dimensions, I heard, like what we see is only the tip of the whatever, you know, the thing that is mostly underwater hippopotamus. Alligator. Ocean. Look, just shut up, all of you, shouted Skinner. He hesitated. The darkness seemed to suck at the sound of his voice. It packed the air like feathers. He pulled himself together a bit. Right then, he said, and turned towards the forbidding doors of the library. He raised his hands, made a few complicated gestures in which his fingers, in some eye-watering way, appeared to pass through each other, and shattered the doors into sawdust. The waves of silence poured back again, strangling the sound of falling wood chips. There was no doubt that the doors were smashed. Four forlorn hinges hung trembling from the frame, and a litter of broken benches and shelves lay in the wreckage. Even Skinner was a little surprised. There, he said. It's as easy as that. You see? Nothing happened to me. Right. There was a shuffling of curly-toed boots. The darkness beyond the doorway was limbed with the indistinct eye-aching glow of thaumaturgic radiation as possibility particles exceeded the speed of reality in a strong magical field. Now then, said Skinner, brightly, who would like the honor of setting the fire? Ten silent seconds later he said, in that case I will do it myself. Honestly, I might as well be talking to the wall. He strode through the doorway and hurried across the floor to the little patch of starlight that lanced down from the glass dome high above the center of the library, although, of course, there has always been considerable debate about the precise geography of the place, heavy concentrations of magic distort time and space, and it is possible that the library doesn't even have an edge, never mind a center. He stretched out his arms. There. See? Absolutely nothing has happened. Now come on in. The other wizards did so, with great reluctance and a tendency to duck as they passed through the ravished arch. Okay, said Skinner, with some satisfaction. Now, has everyone got their matches as instructed? Magical fire won't work, not on these books, so I want everyone to something moved up there, said the smallest wizard. Skinner blinked. What? Something moved up by the dome, said the wizard, adding by way of explanation, I saw it. Skinner squinted upwards into the bewildering shadows, and decided to exert a bit of authority. Nonsense, he said briskly. He pulled out a bundle of foul-smelling yellow matches, and said, Now, I want you all to pile I did see it, you know said the small wizard, sulkily. All right, what did you see? Well, I'm not exactly you don't know, do you, Snap Skinner. I saw some you don't know, repeated Skinner, you're just seeing shadows, just trying to undermine my authority, isn't that it? Skinner hesitated, and his eyes glazed momentarily. I am calm, he intoned. I am totally in control. I will not let it was listen, short arse, you can just jolly well shut up, all right. One of the other wizards, who had been staring upwards to conceal his embarrassment, gave a strangled little cough. E.R., Skinner and that goes for you too. Skinner pulled himself to his full, bristling height and flourished the matches. As I was saying, he said. I want you to light the matches and... I suppose I'll have to show you how to light matches, for the benefit of short arse there and I'm not out of the window, you know. Good grief. Look at me. You take a match he lit a match, the darkness blossomed into a ball of sulfurous white light, 
and the librarian dropped on him like the descent of man. They all knew the librarian, in the same definite but diffused way that people know walls and floors and all the other minor but necessary scenery on the stage of life. If they recall him at all, it was as a sort of gentle mobile sigh, sitting under his desk repairing books, or knuckling his way among the shelves in search of secret smokers. Any wizard unwise enough to hazard a clandestine roll-up wouldn't know anything about it until a soft leathery hand reached up and removed the offending homemade, but the librarian never made a fuss, he just looked extremely hurt and sorrowful about the whole sad business and then ate it. Whereas what was now attempting with considerable effort to unscrew Skinner's head by the ears was a screaming nightmare with its lips curled back to reveal long yellow fangs. The terrified wizards turned to run and found themselves bumping into bookshelves that had unaccountably blocked the aisles. The smallest wizard yelped and rolled under a table laden with atlases, and lay with his hands over his ears to block out the dreadful sounds as the remaining wizards tried to escape. Eventually there was nothing but silence, but it was that particularly massive silence created by something moving very stealthily, as it might be, in search of something else. The smallest wizard ate the tip of his hat out of sheer terror. The silent mover grabbed him by the leg and pulled him gently but firmly out into the open, where he gibbered a bit with his eyes shut and then, when ghastly teeth failed to meet in his throat, ventured a quick glance. The librarian picked him up by the scruff of his neck and dangled him reflectively a foot off the ground, just out of reach of a small and elderly wire-haired terrier who was trying to remember how to bite people's ankles. ER. said the wizard, and was then thrown in an almost flat trajectory through the broken doorway, where his fall was broken by the floor. After a while a shadow next to him said, Well, that's it, then. Anyone seen that daft bastard Skinner? And a shadow on the other side of him said, I think my neck's broken. Who's that? That daft bastard, said the shadow, nastily. Oh. Sorry, Skinner. Skinner stood up, his whole body now outlined in magical aura. He was trembling with rage as he raised his hands. I'll show that wretched throwback to respect his evolutionary superiors he snarled. Get him, lads. And Skinner was born to the flagstones again under the weight of all five wizards. Sorry, but you know that if you use magic near the library, with all the magic that's in there get one thing wrong and it's a critical mass and then... Bang. Good night, world. Skinner growled. The wizards sitting on him decided that getting up was not the wisest thing they could do at this point. Eventually he said, Right. You're right. Thank you. It was wrong of me to lose my temper like that. Clouded my judgment. Essential to be dispassionate. You're absolutely right. Thank you. Get off. They risked it. Skinner stood up. That monkey, he said, has eaten its last banana. Fetch ER. Ape, Skinner, said the smallest wizard, unable to stop himself. It's an ape, you see. Not a monkey. He wilted under the stair. Who cares? Ape, monkey, what's the difference, said Skinner. What's the difference, Mr. Zoologist? I don't know, Skinner, said the wizard meekly. I think it's a class thing. Shut up. Yes, Skinner. You ghastly little man, said Skinner. He turned and added, in a voice as level as a saw blade. I am perfectly controlled. My mind is as cool as a bald mammoth. My intellect is absolutely in charge. Which one of you sat on my head? No, I must not get angry. I am not angry. I am thinking positively. My faculties are fully engaged. Do any of you wish to argue? No, Skinner. They chorused. Then get me a dozen barrels of oil and all the kindling you can find. That ape's gonna fry. 
From high in the library roof, home of owls and bats and other things, there was a clink of chain and the sound of glass being broken as respectfully as possible. They don't look very worried, said Nigel, slightly affronted. How can I put this, said Rinswind. When they come to write the list of great battle cries of the world, ERM, excuse me won't be one of them. He stepped to one side. I'm not with him, he said earnestly to a grinning guard. I just met him, somewhere. In a pit. He gave a little laugh. This sort of thing happens to me all the time, he said. The guards stared through him. ERM, he said. Okay, he said. He sidled back to Nigel. Are you any good with that sword? Without taking his eyes off the guards, Nigel fumbled in his pack and handed Rinswine the book. I've read the whole of Chapter 3, he said. It's got illustrations. Rinswine turned over the crumpled pages. The book had been used so hard you could have shuffled it, but what was probably once the front cover showed a rather poor woodcut of a muscular man. He had arms like two bags full of footballs, and he was standing knee-deep in languorous women and slaughtered victims with a smug expression on his face. About him was the legend. In just seven days I will make you a barbarian hero. Below it, in a slightly smaller type, was the name. Cohen the Barbarian. Rinswind rather doubted it. He had met Cohen and, while he could read after a fashion, the old boy had never really mastered the pen and still signed his name with an X, which he usually spelled wrong. On the other hand, he gravitated rapidly to anything with money in it. Rinswind looked again at the illustration, and then at Nigel. Seven days. Well, I'm a slow reader. Ah, said Rinswind. And I didn't bother with Chapter 6, because I promised my mother I'd stick with just the looting and pillaging, until I find the right girl. And this book teaches you how to be a hero. Oh, yes. It's very good. Nigel gave him a worried glance. That's all right, isn't it? It cost a lot of money. Well, E.R. I suppose you'd better get on with it, then. Nigel squared his, for want of a better word, shoulders and waved his sword again. You four had better just jolly well watch out, he said, or... Hold on a moment. He took the book from Rinswind and riffled through the pages until he found what he was looking for, and continued, yes or the chill winds of fate will blow through your bleached skeletons, the legions of hell will drown your living soul in acid. There. How die you like them? Excuse me a moment. Apples. There was a metallic chord as four men drew their swords in perfect harmony. Nigel's sword became a blur. It made a complicated figure eight in the air in front of him, spun over his arm flicked from hand to hand behind his back, seemed to orbit his chest twice, and leapt like a salmon. One or two of the harem ladies broke into spontaneous applause. Even the guards looked impressed. That's a triple orc thrust with extra flip, said Nigel proudly. I broke a lot of mirrors learning that. Look, they're stopping. They've never seen anything like it, I imagine said Rinswind weakly, judging the distance to the doorway. I should think not. Especially the last bit, where it stuck in the ceiling. Nigel looked upwards. Funny, he said, it always did that at home, too. I wonder what I'm doing wrong. Search me. Gosh, I'm sorry, said Nigel as the guards seemed to realize that the entertainment was over and closed in for the kill. Don't blame yourself, said Rinswind, as Nigel reached up and tried unsuccessfully to free the blade. Thank you. I'll do it for you. Rinswind considered his next step. In fact, he considered several steps. But the door was too far away and anyway, 
by the sound of it, things were not a lot healthier out there. There was only one thing for it. He'd have to try magic. He raised his hand and two of the men fell over. He raised his other hand and the other two fell over. Just as he was beginning to wonder about this, Conan stepped daintily over the prone bodies, idly rubbing the sides of her hands. I thought you'd never turn up, she said. Who's your friend? As has already been indicated, the luggage seldom shows any sign of emotion, or at least any emotion less extreme than blind rage and hatred, and therefore it is hard to gauge its feelings when it woke up, a few miles outside Al-Khali, on its lid in a dried-up wadi with its legs in the air. Even a few minutes after dawn the air was like the breath of a furnace. After a certain amount of rocking the luggage managed to get most of its feet pointing the right way, and stood doing a complicated slow-motion jig to keep as few of them on the burning sand as possible. It wasn't lost. It always knew exactly where it was. It was always here. It was just that everywhere else seemed to have been temporarily mislaid. After some deliberation the luggage turned and walked very slowly, into a boulder. It backed away and sat down, rather puzzled. It felt as though it had been stuffed with hot feathers, and it was dimly aware of the benefits of shade and a nice cool drink. After a few false starts it walked to the top of a nearby sand dune, which gave it an unrivaled view of hundreds of other dunes. Deep in its heartwood the luggage was troubled. It had been spurned. It had been told to go away. It had been rejected. It had also drunk enough orac to poison a small country. If there is one thing a travel accessory needs more than anything else, it is someone to belong to. The luggage set off unsteadily across the scorching sand, full of hope. I don't think we've got time for introductions, said Rinswind, as a distant part of the palace collapsed with a thump that vibrated the floor. It's time we were he realized he was talking to himself. Nigel let go of the sword. Conan stepped forward. Oh, no, said Rinswind, but it was far too late. The world had suddenly separated into two parts. The bit which contained Nigel and Conanna, and the bit which contained everything else. The air between them crackled. Probably, in their half, a distant orchestra was playing, bluebirds were tweeting, little pink clouds were barreling through the sky and all the other things that happen at times like this. When that sort of thing is going on, mere collapsing palaces in the next world don't stand a chance. Look, perhaps we can just get the introductions over with, said Rinswine desperately. Nigel the Destroyer said Nigel dreamily. All right, Nigel the Destroyer, said Rinswine, and added, Son of hair but the mighty, said Nigel. Rinswind gaped a bit, and then shrugged. Well, whoever, he conceded. Anyway, this is Konina. Which is rather a coincidence, because you'll be interested to know that her father was MMPH. Konina, without turning her gaze, had extended a hand and held Rinswind's face in a gentle grip which, with only a slight increase in finger pressure, could have turned his head into a bowling ball. Although I could be mistaken, he added, when she took her hand away. Who knows? Who cares? What does it matter? They didn't take any notice. I'll just go and see if I can find the hat, shall I? He said. Good idea, murmured Konina. I expect I shall get murdered, but I don't mind, said Rinswind. Jolly good, said Nigel. I don't expect anyone will even notice I'm gone, said Rinswind. Fine, fine, said Konina. I shall be chopped into small pieces, I expect, said Rinswind, walking toward the door at the speed of a dying snail. Konina blinked. What hat, she said, and then, oh, that hat. I suppose there's no possible chance that you two might be of some assistance. 
Rinswine ventured. Somewhere inside Konina and Nigel's private world the bluebirds went to roost, the little pink clouds drifted away and the orchestra packed up and sneaked off to do a private gig at a nightclub somewhere. A bit of reality reasserted itself. Konina dragged her admiring gaze away from Nigel's rapt face and turned it on to Rinswind, where it grew slightly cooler. She sidled across the floor and grabbed the wizard by the arm. Look, she said, you won't tell him who I really am, will you? Only boys get funny ideas and well, anyway, if you do I will personally break all your I'll be far too busy, said Rinswind, what with you helping me get the hat and everything. Not that I can imagine what you see in him, he added, haughtily. He's nice. I don't seem to meet many nice people. Yes, well he's looking at us. So what? You're not frightened of him, are you? Suppose he talks to me. Rinswind looked blank. Not for the first time in his life, he felt that there were whole areas of human experience that had passed him by, if areas could pass by people. Maybe he had passed them by. He shrugged. Why did you let them take you off to the harem without a fight, he said. I've always wanted to know what went on in one. There was a pause. Well, said Rinswind. Well, we all sat round, and then after a bit the seraph came in, and then he asked me over and said that since I was new it would be my turn, and then, you'll never guess what he wanted me to do. The girl said it's the only thing he's interested in. ER. Are you all right? Fine, fine, Rinswind muttered. Your face has gone all shiny. No, I'm fine, fine. He asked me to tell him a story. What about, said Rinswind suspiciously. The other girl said he prefers something with rabbits in it. Ah. Rabbits. Small fluffy white ones. But the only stories I know are the ones father taught me when I was little, and I don't think they're really suitable. Not many rabbits. Lots of arms and legs being chopped off, said Konina, and sighed. That's why you mustn't tell him about me you see. I'm just not cut out for a normal life. Telling stories in a harem isn't bloody normal, said Rinswind. It'll never catch on. He's looking at us again. Konina grabbed Rinswine's arm. He shook her off. Oh, good grief, he said, and hurried across the room to Nigel, who grabbed his other arm. You haven't been telling her about me, have you? he demanded. I'll never live it down if you've told her that I'm only just learning how no no no. She just wants you to help us. It's a sort of quest. Nigel's eyes gleamed. You mean a geese, he said. Pardon. It's in the book. To be a proper hero it says you've got to labor under a geese. Rinswine's forehead wrinkled. Is it a sort of bird? I think it's more a sort of obligation, or something, said Nigel, but without much certainty. Sounds more like a kind of bird to me, said Rinswind. I'm sure I read it in a bestiary once. Large. Couldn't fly. Big pink legs, it had. His face went blank as his ears digested what they had just heard his lips say. Five seconds later they were out of the room, leaving behind four prone guards and the harem ladies themselves, who settled down for a bit of storytelling. The desert rimwards of Alkali is bisected by the river sort famed in myth and lies, which insinuates its way through the brown landscapes like a long damp descriptive passage punctuated with sandbanks. And every sandbank is covered with sun-baked logs, and most of the logs are the kind of logs that have teeth, and most of the logs opened one lazy eye at the distant sounds of splashing from upstream, and suddenly most of the logs had legs. A dozen scaly bodies slipped into the turbid waters, which rolled over them again. The dark waters were unruffled, except for a few inconsequential v. 
shaped ripples. The luggage paddled gently down the stream. The water was making it feel a little better. It spun gently in the weak current, the focus of several mysterious little swirls that sped across the surface of the water. The ripples converged. The luggage jerked. Its lid flew open. It shot under the surface with a brief, despairing creak. The chocolate-colored waters of the sort rolled back again. They were getting good at it. And the tower of sorcery loomed over Alkali like a vast and beautiful fungus, the kind that appear in books with little skull and crossbones symbols beside them. The Seraphas guard had fought back, but there were now quite a lot of bewildered frogs and newts around the base of the tower, and they were the fortunate ones. They still had arms and legs, of a sort, and most of their essential organs were still on the inside. The city was under the rule of sorcery. Martial lore. Some of the buildings nearest the base of the tower were already turning into the bright white marble that the wizards obviously preferred. The trio stared out through a hole in the palace walls. Very impressive, said Conan critically. Your wizards are more powerful than I thought. Not my wizards, said Rinswind. I don't know whose wizards they are. I don't like it. All the wizards I knew couldn't stick one brick on another. I don't like the idea of wizards ruling everybody, said Nigel. Of course, as a hero I am philosophically against the whole idea of wizardry in any case. The time will come when, his eyes glazed slightly, as if he was trying to remember something he'd seen somewhere, the time will come when all wizardry has gone from the face of the world and the sons of, of. Anyway, we can all be a bit more practical about things, he added lamely. Read it in a book, did you, said Rinswine sourly. Any geese in it? He's got a point, said Konina. I've nothing against wizards, but it's not as if they do much good. They're just a bit of decoration, really. Up to now. Rinswine pulled off his hat. It was battered stained and covered with rock dust, bits of it had been sheared off, the point was dented and the star was shedding sequins like pollen, but the word blizzard was still just readable under the grime. See this, he demanded, red in the face. Do you see it? Do you? What does it tell you? That you can't spell, said Nigel. What? No. It says I'm a wizard that's what. Twenty years behind the staff, and proud of it. I've done my time, I have. I've pa. I've sat dozens of exams. If all the spells I've read were piled on top of one another, they'd. It. You'd have a lot of spells. Yes, but Conina began. Yes. You're not actually very good at them, are you? Rinswind glared at her. He tried to think of what to say next, and a small receptor area opened in his mind at the same time as an inspiration particle, its path bent and skewed by a trillion random events, screamed down through the atmosphere and burst silently just at the right spot. Talent just defines what you do, he said. It doesn't define what you are. Deep down, I mean. When you know what you are, you can do anything. He thought a bit more and added, that's what makes sorcerers so powerful. The important thing is to know what you really are. There was a pause full of philosophy. Rinswind, said Konina, kindly. Hmm, said Rinswind, who was still wondering how the words got into his head. You really are an idiot. Do you know that? You will all stand very still. Abrim the vizier stepped out of a ruined archway. He was wearing the archchancellor's hat. The desert fried under the flame of the sun. Nothing moved except the shimmering air, hot as a stolen volcano, dry as a skull. A basilisk lay panting in the baking shade of a rock, dribbling corrosive yellow slime. 
For the last five minutes its ears had been detecting the faint thump of hundreds of little legs moving unsteadily over the dunes, which seemed to indicate that dinner was on the way. It blinked its legendary eyes and uncoiled twenty feet of hungry body, winding out and on to the sand like fluid death. The luggage staggered to a halt and raised its lid threateningly. The basilisk hissed, but a little uncertainly, because it had never seen a walking box before, and certainly never one with lots of alligator teeth stuck in its lid. There were also scraps of leathery hide adhering to it, as though it had been involved in a fight in a handbag factory, and in a way that the basilisk wouldn't have been able to describe even if it could talk, it appeared to be glaring. Right, the reptile thought, if that's the way you want to play it. It turned on the luggage a stare like a diamond drill, a stare that nipped in via the stare's eyeballs and flayed the brain from the inside, a stare that tore the frail net curtains on the windows of the soul, a stare that the basilisk realized something was very wrong. An entirely new and unwelcome sensation started to arise just behind its saucer-shaped eyes. It started small like the little itch in those few square inches of back that no amount of writhing will allow you to scratch, and grew until it became a second, red-hot, internal sun. The basilisk was feeling a terrible, overpowering and irresistible urge to blink. It did something incredibly unwise. It blinked. He's talking through his hat, said Rinswind. Eh, said Nigel who was beginning to realize that the world of the barbarian hero wasn't the clean, simple place he had imagined in the days when the most exciting thing he had ever done was stack parsnips. The hat's talking through him, you mean, said Konina, and she backed away too, as one tends to do in the presence of horror. Eh. I will not harm you. You have been of some service, said Abrim, stepping forwards with his hands out but you are right. He thought he could gain power through wearing me. Of course, it is the other way around. An astonishingly devious and clever mind. So you tried his head on for size, said Rinswind. He shuddered. He'd worn the hat. Obviously he didn't have the right kind of mind. Abrim did have the right kind of mind, and now his eyes were grey and colourless. His skin was pale and he walked as though his body was hanging down from his head. Nigel had pulled out his book and was riffling feverishly through the pages. What on earth are you doing, said Konina, not taking her eyes off the ghastly figure. I'm looking up the index of wandering monsters, said Nigel. Do you think it's an undead? They're awfully difficult to kill, you need garlic and dash you won't find this in there said Rinswine slowly. It's... It's a vampire hat. Of course, it might be a zombie, said Nigel, running his finger down a page. It says here you need black pepper and sea salt, but you're supposed to fight the bloody things, not eat them, said Konina. This is a mind I can use, said the hat. Now I can fight back. I shall rally wizardry. There is room for only one magic in this world, and I embody it. Sorcery beware. Oh, no, said Rinswind under his breath. Wizardry has learned a lot in the last twenty centuries. This upstart can be beaten. You three will follow me. It wasn't a request. It wasn't even an order. It was a sort of forecast. The voice of the hat went straight to the hindbrain without bothering to deal with the consciousness, and Rinswine's legs started to move of their own accord. The other two also jerked forward, walking with the awkward doll-like jerking that suggested that they, too, were on invisible strings. Why the oh, no, said Konina, I mean, oh, no on general principles I can understand, but was there any particular reason? If we get a chance we must run, said Rinswind. Did you have anywhere in mind? It probably won't matter. We're doomed anyway. Why, said Nigel. Well, said Rinswind, 
have you ever heard of the Mage Wars? There were a lot of things on the disc that owed their origin to the Mage Wars. Sapient Pearwood was one of them. The original tree was probably perfectly normal and spent its days drinking groundwater and eating sunshine in a state of blessed unawareness and then the magic wars broke around it and pitchforked its genes into a state of acute perspicacity. It also left it ingrained, as it were, with a bad temper. But sapient pearwood got off lightly. Once, when the level of background magic on the disc was young and high and found every opportunity to burst on the world, wizards were all as powerful as sorcerers and built their towers on every hilltop. And if there was one thing a really powerful wizard can't stand, it is another wizard. His instinctive approach to diplomacy is to hex them till they glow, then curse them in the dark. That could only mean one thing. All right, two things. Three things. All out. Thaumaturgical. War. And there were of course no alliances, no sides, no deals, no mercy, no cease. The skies twisted, the seas boiled. The scream and whiz of fireballs turned the night into day, but that was all right because the ensuing clouds of black smoke turned the day into night. The landscape rose and fell like a honeymoon duve, and the very fabric of space itself was tied in multidimensional knots and bashed on a flat stone down by the river of time. For example, a popular spell at the time was Pelipel's temporal compressor, which on one occasion resulted in a race of giant reptiles being created, evolving, spreading, flourishing, and then being destroyed in the space of about five minutes leaving only its bones in the earth to mislead forthcoming generations completely. Trees swam, fishes walked, mountains strolled down to the shops for a packet of cigarettes, and the mutability of existence was such that the first thing any cautious person would do when they woke up in the mornings was count their arms and legs. That was, in fact, the problem. All the wizards were pretty evenly matched and in any case lived in high towers well protected with spells, which meant that most magical weapons rebounded and landed on the common people who were trying to scratch an honest living from what was, temporarily, the soil, and lead ordinary, decent, but rather short, lives. But still the fighting raged, battering the very structure of the universe of order weakening the walls of reality and threatening to topple the whole rickety edifice of time and space into the darkness of the dungeon dimensions. One story said that the gods stepped in, but the gods don't usually take a hand in human affairs unless it amuses them. Another one. And this was the one that the wizards themselves told, and wrote down in their books. Was that the wizards themselves got together and settled their differences amicably for the good of mankind. Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.